Armory might be a little short on mana, and he is, so he's going to have to pass the turn back to Ketter, who's going to untap. He'll take a draw step here. We'll see what he's able to find. And it looks like he does have a Reaper of the Wild, so Cass is Adrian just kind of putting his hands out, saying, bring it on, as the yeah. Stomping Ground's going to come into play. Ketter going to go down to 18, 3, and 4. And this is a Lacronos World Eater. So as bad as this kind of this is for Adrian, it's better actually to, that it be this rather than a Planeswalker, yeah. as it means if he can find Supreme Verdict in time, he can clean up all the damage. Kent okay, going to draw a card here. He's going to play Overgrown Tomb untapped. Look like he's going to go with the dragon. That's exactly what he's going to do. So he's going to come across for nine points of damage. Sullivan's going to move down to 11. And you know you have to probably assume that Adrian does have a Verdict in his hand. He's just looking to draw an untapped land here. Looks like he does add a card to his hand, but I do not believe that it's a land. And he might have to cast a Divination to get out of this. And if he has, like, if he has a Divination, he might just be dead on board. Hey, Kenner has, has 10 power in play. And then he can activate the monstrosity. Yeah. And the draw was a land, but it was a tapped one. It was a copy of Temple of Enlightenment. And as great as that card is, it's not the land that Adrian's looking for. You see him's going to scry here. You see a divination in his hand that he probably can't afford to cast. He might have a detention sphere over there, to be fair. So he could still certainly be OK here. And he is going to cast detention sphere. So he's doing all right. This is going to take care of the world eater with the Azorius enchantment. Pass the turn back. Ketter will take an untapped step. He'll take a draw. See what he's able to find here. He does have another Storm Breath in his hand. But I, I think ideally he would like to leave that Storm Breath as kind of leftovers. Yes. You know, he's got, of course, Supreme Verdict has to be on his radar right now. If he can force Adrian to pull the trigger on Supreme Verdict uh, while keeping Storm Breath Dragon back in his hand, that's the best of both worlds. He's going to just attack here for five. He's going to play a Reaper of the Wilds and pass the turn back. Now, Reaper is a card that obviously has not seen a lot of plays since Supreme Verdict. It's going to clear up all the creatures, and there's going to be two Scry Triggers that go in the stack because the creatures are dead now. So Ketter can actually help himself to find that fifth land. As you do see, the Golgari Rare, the Gorgon, this is a card that hasn't seen a lot of play, which is borderline ridiculous to me, even though, again, metagames are ecosystems and context is everything. So it does make sense why it wouldn't see a ton of play just because of the context of the format. But that card's incredible. Yeah, I know Brian Kibler was playing several copies of these in various Golgari decks that he was working yeah. on early on in the season. He never had a ton of tournament success with those, but he always spoke very highly of, of Reaper of the Wilds. Sorvent Dragon number two comes in as Reaper of the Wilds was able to scry a land over to the top of Ketter's deck. So now Sullivan's at two. And one thing you know about Blue White Control is that it has a lot of problems with Storm Breath Dragon. Yeah, you're looking at uh, the minus power on Elspeth and Supreme Verdict, of course, but it, it is a challenging card to answer. Now, if you take a look at Sullivan's deck list, I know he's a really big fan of uh, Celestial Fair. Flare, excuse me. I don't know if that's a card that he's playing in his main deck or not over the course of this weekend. And I know he's a huge fan of it. And the answer looks like it's no, because he's conceding this game. Yeah, the answer is no. He has uh, he has one copy of Elspeth, four copies of uh, Supreme Verdict, and then various counters to keep to get it off the table once it's there or prevent it from getting on the table in the first place. But uh, not a ton of answers. Well. We see Ketter is up a game here, and you've got Sullivan's sideboard in front of you, so we're taking a look at the deck already. What's he got in his sideboard? He has a Jace Memory Adept, a Blind Obedience, a Glare of Heresy, four Gainsays, a Debtor's Pulpit, two Celestial Flares, a Keening Apparition, and Negate, a Last Breath, a Domestication. He has one in his main deck and then one in the sideboard, and a Faded Retribution. So uh, pretty typical of blue-white style decks to have a lot of one and two ofs, uh, as it's just trying to... Most of the time, it's trying to clean up matchups on the margins. It has to play a couple inefficient cards in its main deck in nearly all matchups because it's trying to answer the field, basically, mm -hmm. as a control deck. And so your sideboard games are often, I'm going to take out four inefficient cards and bring in four more efficient ones. Uh, Ketter's sideboard here, this is obviously something I'm going to be familiar with because um, I'm very familiar with this deck. Two Rakdos Return, two Golgari Charm, two Abrupt Decay, two Ultimate Price, two Rule Charm, two Dreadbore, a Xenagos God of Revels, a Rurik Thar the Unbound, and a Sire of Insanity. Um, if I am in Kent's seat here, uh, how I would sideboard against Blue White is I would board in the two returns, the two charms, the two abrupt decays, um, the two uh, the two additional dread boards to go to make it so you have four uh, Zenigos, God of Revels, a Rurik Thar, and a Sire of Insanity. That's eleven cards that are coming in there. Um, Dreadboard, particularly good in this matchup because uh, it's a way to answer Jace. It's a way to answer people who bring an Archangel of Thune and or Brumaz. And it's also a way to answer Elspeth. Mm -hmm. So it has a lot of practical uses in this matchup. And the way that blue-white decks sideboard against you, uh, it's good against that as well. Reactor's Return, obviously, good against a control deck. I don't think that needs much explanation. Uh, same thing can be said about Abrupt Decay against Detention Sphere. Uh, you like Algarian Charm because it takes care of Detention Sphere, but it also has a regeneration effect against Elspeth and Supreme Verdict. So uh, that card's obviously quite good in this matchup. And then uh, Rurik. Thar and Sire of Insanity are just two six-mana haymakers that if they resolve, chances are you're probably going to win. Yeah, they're both very close to game over. Yeah. 
and the, the same thing can be said about the Xenagos God of Rebels, too. And the reason, you know, that there's just a one-off in the sideboard, it's just kind of a Miser's one-off, honestly. Um, it's really good if you draw it, but as we discussed when we saw Green and Monsters a little bit earlier, the second one is basically a blank card. Yeah, and it's interesting to see how Adrian's going to sideboard. Usually when you're playing against creature decks in general, you're trying to remove your counter spells for more sweepers or more things to play to the board. Because your yeah. counters aren't as efficient as spy removal or just your own big threats or what have you. Uh, if Adrian is familiar with this list, and like you said, you have been po you posted this and talked about this, yep. the counter spells are actually pretty good. You're bringing in a lot of five and six mana cards. Yes, they are. Th good. They're still valuable. So uh, it's interesting to see if Adrian's first of all going to identify this, and then if that's the case, how does he sideboard in the face of those cards? Maybe he said maybe he actually keeps something very close to the same sixty he presented in game one. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a chance of that. Um, I do like the one Debtor's Pulpit in the sideboard. I like that too. Debtor's Pulpit was a sort of a breakout card at the return to Raven. Uh, sorry, rather the uh, um, the last the San Diego Pro, Pro Tour, Tour Dragons Maze. Dragons Maze, rather. Sorry, the Black Pro Tour as a way in the Control Mirror match, uh, or for Green White decks to answer Aetherling. Yeah. It actually, effectively stops Aetherling. It can also uh, stop protection from white creatures because even though Dinner Pulp itself is white, the land itself is colorless. So you Correct. can still target uh, pro white creatures with your land, which is not the most intuitive interaction. So uh, because of Storm Breath Dragon, big monsters in general, it's possible that card comes in, even though it, it may not be uh, the card that the deck that Adrian had in mind when he put that card into sideboard. Yeah. It definitely does have its uses here. As you do see, both players will be shuffling up here to get ready for game number two. Kent Ketter quickly, quickly, quickly moving up our StarCityGames.com leaderboard here in the race to the Players' Championship in Season 1 qualification. Uh, again, two runner-up performances for him. One in uh, Columbus with Red White Devotion. The other one in Nashville with Green Red Monsters. Uh, he also has a PTQ Finals off to Green Red Monsters as well. And now he is off to another great start, sitting here at 4-0 with Jun Monsters. He's number 58 on our leaderboard. Um, but he is moving up really, really fast. 46 points so far this season. And, you know, if he's able to keep it rolling, <laughs> That overall leaderboard at the end of the year, he's going to be one of those eight of large bids. And this is a player that you're actually familiar with prior to his last couple tournaments. Yeah. When, uh, you know, uh, in Indianapolis, that was the first time that, that Ken and I ever, ever really talked, but it seemed like you two went back a little bit. Yeah, it was interesting. I played against him. I, I didn't know him um, until there was a, before I guess it was called the Open Series, I guess when they were called 5Ks or 10Ks or whatever they were called. Obviously, this is a little while ago. Um, I flew to Seattle to hang out with my now best friend, uh, Stephen Berkelin. And there was a tournament that weekend. And so I flew there because uh, way back when there was a Turboland deck that involved Jace and Oracle of Moldiah and Halimer Depths and all this other stuff um, that I really, really liked and worked really, really hard on. I wanted to go play a tournament and I wanted to go to Seattle anyway because my plan was to move there after graduation. And uh, Stephen and I were just becoming friends and flew there during that weekend of the tournament. Now, uh, if you remember the history of this tournament, Lewis Scott Vargas ended up losing in the finals with that Turboland deck, but I played Kent in round seven or eight. We were both six, six and one. Um, ended up drawing against him, uh, kind of unfortunately knocking both of us out of the tournament. Um, but it was really fun match. He's a really charismatic guy. Uh, obviously loves playing Magic. Uh, it was a lot of fun to be around in our match. He was playing Jun. He was the enemy uh, for that particular round. Uh, but it really just stuck with me as a, just a really nice person to play Magic against. I really enjoyed the experience. And now, you know, a couple of years later, I mean, honestly, maybe five years later, now I see him back here in Indianapolis. He lives in Bloomington, which is where I went to co close to where I went to college. And now he's just having a great deal of success. So you see him play a turn two Sylvan Carrington. It's crazy how you meet people many moons ago, and then you see them again. It's like, oh, I haven't seen you for a while. How you been? And he's like, I'm getting really good at magic. That's how <laughs> I've been. And he's been, uh, he's been tearing it up recently. You see Adrian's going to play an island and pass the turn back. So no mana issues this game for the blue-white control player. And so one thing that you see a lot of the times, Patrick, um, with the Green Red Monsters deck, for example, is they'll sideboard out their Karyatids um, because it's just going to get swept up underneath uh, Supreme Verdict. You see, Negate's going to take care of the Planeswalker here. But because there's a Black Splash in this Jun Monsters deck, you got to, uh, you got to, you got to have that, uh, that, that Sylvan Carry to there. And this is interesting, too. Uh, Adrian actually has no Negate's main and one in his sideboard. So instead of removing counters, it looks, if anything, like he's brought in additional copies. Yeah, and additional copies, especially a card like Negate. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, against just particular green red monsters because they have access to in between six and seven planeswalkers it's great against them but against this build of jun monsters they're boarding in spells charm rakdos's return stuff like that as you see a reaper of the wilds placed under the stack here by ketter 
And Planeswalkers are just the, the most typical way that this deck goes about attacking people. Of course. Or attacking control decks, rather. Yeah. And Negate is a fantastic sideboard card against both versions of that big green, red, or if you do or do not have the black splash. As Sullivan does ask, Ketter, how many cards in your hand while this Reaper of the Wilds is on the stack? Looks like he uh, might have a counter spell to take care of this. Doesn't know, I don't know if he wants to counter it, though. Seems a little gun shy. It looks like that's going to be good to go. Ketter's going to play a stomping ground and pass the turn back here. So Sullivan will take a draw step. We'll see what he finds. If Adrian could counter that and chose not to, that's a pretty bad sign for Kent this game. I am inclined to agree. I did see an Essence Scatter in Sullivan's hand, so he chose not to. He made that decision, and now you see he's in the old Tankaroo. Let's see what he comes out with on his turn. Of course, he would like to wait as long as possible to fire off this uh, Supreme Verdict so he can do it with a Counterspell backup. Mm -hmm. So Adrian looks resigned to taking a few lumps here to try to set up the best possible scenario, which is clear your board, counterspell backup, now go to my turn, lock the game up. Using his life total as a resource here yeah. is basically what he's doing as he does pass the turn back here to Ketter, who's going to fire up Mutable. And he's going to get in the red zone here with Mutable and Reaper of the Wilds. Now, one thing about Reaper of the Wilds in this matchup, not the best card, obviously going to die Supreme Bird and stuff like that, but if you're able to untap with it, you know, you can protect it with the Hexproof from Azorius Charm and Attention Sphere and things of that nature. I don't think you're expecting Reaper of the Wilds to actually get the job done here as a revelation is going to, you know, undo the damage that the Mutavault has done. But more importantly, it's going to get Sullivan two more cards to facilitate the game plan that you just talked about. Just make his land drops and try to set up uh, a Wrath and with a Counterspell back. There's a Temple of Enlightenment, arguably the best temple in Born of the Gods. Blue-white decks have historically been the ones best, most equipped to play with a bunch of call, uh, comes into play tap lands. And now Ketter is going to have Golgari Charm to make it so that he can regenerate his creatures in response to this verdict. So none of the creatures will die. That will be tapped from regeneration. And now we are good to go. So Ketter is going to untap. He'll take a draw here. He could probably just play the same song and dance if he'd like. Depends on what he drew for the turn. He's going to go with the Temple of Abandon to start things off, keep that card on top very quickly, fire up a Mutavault, and red zone it is. So across for six, Sullivan's going to go down to ten. And I'm interested to see if something like Golgari Charm was even on Sullivan's radar that previous turn. This is another copy of Supreme Verdict, and that, let's see if that's going to get the job done. Adrian may have felt last turn that I'm okay to cash in this one because I have yeah. a backup one. So that will get the job done. A scry here from Ketter from uh, Sylvan Carriage to die because Reaper doesn't scry for itself. He's going to keep that card on top that he saw previously with Temple of Abandon. He's going to draw a card. Looks like it's a Domri. So let's see if this resolves here. He's going to go for it. And if, if, if Ken has a backup play, that's, that's one thing. But I think that uh, if I were... Ken, I would have let off that turn with attacking with Mutavault, if possible. You might be able to induce a Last Breath or an Azorius Charm, and then mm -hmm. your Domri definitely resolves. There's some risk of running that into the untapped mana here. Mutavault's going to come in now. Chooses to attack with Mutavault as opposed to playing Corsair on that turn. And so now he's going to play Sylvan Carriage and pass the turn back. The Sylvan Carriage hit explains it. Sure. He still had something to do with his mana. Yeah. And against the blue-white decks, it's really important to, to take your shots to get in damage when you can, because uh, often that's the only thing that's preventing you from getting completely locked out is the fact that they have to still respond to your board once their life total gets low enough. So it's really critical to hit with Mutavault as much as you can. Detention Sphere being placed on the stack. You see Adrian has tapped an island and a plane, so he's trying to figure out, okay, what's the third mana I want to tap for this? Do I want to tap my Mutavault or maybe my basic planes, I think, is the decision he's making. He's going to go with basic planes, says get that Domri out of here and pass the turn back, knowing that he's pretty safe right now. He knows what's on top, and he knows that there's a Corsair in Ketter's hand. So not a lot to be afraid of right now if you're the blue-eyed control player. Yeah. And now, you know, Adrian's kind of worked the game into the spot where one of his big draws here, certainly another Supreme Verdict would be pretty good. Uh, Sphinx's Revelation, uh, Elspeth even, were, are, all, are all enormous draws. Blood Crypt is the card that's revealed here for Ketter. He's going to put that into play tap to gain a life, go up to 19. Top card? That is an Elvish Mystic. He's just going to pass the turn back as he cannot play the Mutavolt this turn. He wants to get that land into play from the Corsair. Sullivan's going to play a Temple of Enlightenment yet again. Control the top card of his deck. Play a Detention Sphere. Bye-bye goes that Corsair. And now here is a Disperse. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> someone, someone triggered their Detention Sphere and dispersed it. That's what we like to call value. Yeah. 
That's the old Oblivion Ring trick that we haven't seen for a little while. So now there's an Elvish Mystic, there's Mutaball and passing the turn back. So that means Sullivan does have an attention sphere at the ready. And I know, and you know, I obviously have the privilege of doing this because I get to read Adrian's articles a bunch uh, for the other hat that I wear, but he is a huge fan of Disperse. Yeah. Huge, huge, huge fan of that card. Very flexible, and you know, when you have things like Sphinx's Revelation in your deck, what the most important thing is make sure you can answer the board. Yes. You know, just what if you can keep your head above water well enough, then Revelations takes care of the rest. So, Polychronos being placed on the stack here by Sullivan, or excuse me, by Keter. We'll see if Sullivan does care about this or not. Now, he still has the Detention Sphere Latour. He has an Essence Scatter, mm -hmm. but it's possible that he wants to hold that exclusively for Stormbath Dragon yep. or some other creature, maybe like Sire of Insanity, for yep. example, that requires an instant speed response. So, you see Adrian's going to think this through, and he says, all right, that's fine. Also, letting this resolve has the additional upside of if Adrian draws Supreme Verdict, it's all the juicier having let this thing come into play. Yeah, you get it all, which is certainly important as Adrian does draw a card for the turn. We'll see if he does want to use a deep sphere on this. He's sitting at a pretty comfortable 10, all things considered. Yeah. Yes, those monsters do hit hard, but 10 is a lot of life. As you are pretty deep into the uh, mid game here, we're working our way towards a late game. Nadrin has to dissolve in his hand as well. So Keter is going to untap. He'll take a draw. Can't attack with that Elvish Mystic because of Mutavolt being in the way. It looks like a Stormbreath Dragon was the draw for the day. And Adrian getting really paid off for his sequencing last turn. Uh, it's possible, uh, we don't know the dialogue. Adrian might have waited a little too long debating about this Pelucranos. Looks like he goes, Keter's going to activate Mutavolt, ask if he can attack, the answer is yes. See if Adrian wants to trade his Mutavolt here for this. Or if he's just fine going down to eight, which that could be the case. Again, using his life total as a resource. He's going to pass the turn, so Keter does not cast the dragon. Very disciplined. You know, there's still cards that Adrian, you know, Elspeth, the most the, the, the most obvious one that would cause him to tap low. So the Stormbreath Dragon, you know, he wants to hold off, maybe set up a turn where he can cast multiple spells in one turn, mm -hmm. uh, or hope that Adrian taps low enough to allow him to resolve the dragon. Temple of Abandon is going to leave the top card on top, and now Stormbreath Dragon is going to be placed onto the stack. I can't imagine this resolving. I imagine, <laughs> I imagine this gets countered. <laughs> you see, Catter says, I have no cards. I have a good card on top of my deck, but I have no cards. And this begs the question, too, about the sequencing there from Keter, because he played Temple first and kept his card on top, whereas if he doesn't do that, now this is giving Adrian pause about if he should counter a spell, I think, whereas if he plays a Temple afterward, maybe it's a different scenario, but maybe, maybe the fact that Keter played the Temple and said, keep this card, mm -hmm. changes the way Adrian plays, too. So there's a little, you know, game all inside these the game. All these little things, you know, once you get... Once you get players of these ability levels, all those little things add up. Yes. So now Mutavolt's going to get fired up. Sullivan knows that Keter has no cards in his hand. Keter going to come across with a 2-2 land. Looks like Sullivan's going to go down to six. Again, still using that life total as a resource. He's going to play Mutavolt number two and pass. And I think he might be comfortable trading now. Yeah, I, I think he wanted to keep the Mutavolt back because if nothing else, the Mutavolt's fending off the Elvis Mystic, so it's not great to trade right away. But a second Mutavolt certainly cleans things up. Yeah. So let's see what Keter drew, because he kept the top card on top, and you see him counting mana. Never a good feeling. And you have to presume that this is a real spell, so he's going to use the carry to, to activate the Muta Vault and come into the red zone here. Sullivan's going to go down to four. Still holds firm. Wow, okay. You see Kent counting the mana. He's counting his mana, counting Adrian's mana. There's probably some X spells to be involved here. <laughs> yeah, there's Arachnos' return from Keter, and he says the full amount, and that's going to get dissolved. Oof. That is a very crucial dissolve. And you see Keter, the reason he was counting there is because he wanted to know, okay, can, if you revelation in response, are you still dead? It looks like the answer would have been yes. And so now there is a revelation. It looks like it's going to be a baby rev. Yeah, just a small little rev here. Adrian's going to go up to seven. But more importantly at this point, I think, are the cards that he's drawing. And now he, he has more resources to, to work with. So now he can uh, be way more inclined to trade Mutavolts if he's, if he's feeling like it. Two man on the main phase is going to be a blind obedience. So that's going to do a nice job of taking care of dragons moving forward. And now there's an elixir of immortality. And you can kind of feel it now. Yeah, it's, he's starting to get the, to lock it up. And blind obedience is so good against haste creatures, of course. And just it makes every counter spell Adrian's able to resolve Eve that much better. And you, you, the other thing that you can tell here, too, is Golgari Charm is the card that Keter drew for the turn, is you can really tell that Adrian has played this deck so much because it would have been so easy to just say, okay, Mutavolt, trade with your Mutavolt. 
or something like that. And he says, no, I'll go to six. No, I'll go to four. That's yeah. okay with me. Because, again, four is not zero. So you can tell he's very, very comfortable with what he's doing. And now he's going to use Elixir and move up to 13. Shovel two revelations back into mm -hmm. his deck as well. There's just, uh, this is a very classic style of blue-white game. Adrian focused on making his land drops, keeping his mana up, using his life as a resource, and now he's worked the game to this position where he's a huge favorite. And I admire the sideboard cards or one of that Adrian is playing, a card like a Blind Obedience, it's a card that doesn't see a lot of play, but it serves a purpose. And the purpose that it serves is a very good one. Stormbreath Dragon is a very large problem for this sort of deck. And the fact that now Stormbreath Dragon is just, you know, doesn't really matter now. <laughs> That's happening as Temple of Lightman put the top card to the bottom. Here's a Corsair of Proofix for Kent. So he's going to try to get back into this here. See what he finds on top. It's Blue Kronos yet again. A card that plays a huge role in certain matchups, but this is not one of them. Yeah. Actually feels like a card that, if anything, maybe should be sided out. Yeah, I mean, you don't want a lot of copies. Obviously, you want to be able to pressure them to some extent. But you're, of course, not expecting that card to get the job done. And so now here's a Jace Architect of Thought. First one that we've seen of this match here from Sullivan's side. Okay. We'll, get the, uh, we'll get the big die on that for you guys in just a moment. It's a Temple of Deceit, a Celestial Flare, and a Dissolver turned off the top. And those, are, those two spells are both so good. Oof. Now, I presume that he's just going to take whatever pile has to dissolve in it. Because, you know, there are some idiots out there with Elvish Mystic and Univolt that can eat the Celestial Flare. But we'll see how Ketter decides to split this. Yeah, Adrian's not really worried about the board, certainly, mm -hmm. in this position, as, as he's got a pretty well-contained high life total, some Univolts to work with. Uh, and like you said, the Flare's not very efficient right now, as there's an Elvish Mystic that can be thrown into the Maw if, if Kent's worried about playing around it. Yeah. So. So you do see the split there of Flare and Temple of Deceit versus Dissolve. You see Adrian's going to count some lands here, maybe wondering what's the worst thing that can happen to me with all the mana that you do have available. And don't forget now, we, we talk about Blind Obedience, the fact that it's going to stop Stormbreath Dragon. Look how much mana that Adrian has used for that Jace. Five. Yeah. Gaining a life with every spell. So now he's getting himself out of Rakdos return range. Uh, you know, Stormbreath Dragon isn't really going to be that big of a deal. Every card, every spell that he plays is going to gain him a little bit more life, get him back up to that 20, you know, that he wants to be at, and just keep moving along. It's really funny. When Blind Obedience got previewed, everyone's first reaction was, how do I build a Blind Obedience deck? Yeah. 4X Blind Obedience, that's the start of the deck list. That never worked out for, for obvious reasons. Yeah. Uh, but as a one of in your 75 somewhere, a much different animal. I've lost to that card a lot. Yes. For a card that I'm sure my co opponent has only one copy of in their 75, I've lost a lot of matches. So Simon Grant's going to come and play untapped. Ketter is only going to end up taking one from that. Two, because it comes to play untapped. One from the Courser trigger, going to put him up a life here. As you see Courser on top of the deck now as well. But you can really feel that the momentum has shifted Adrian Sullivan's way this game. You know, he's got a Jace out there. He's got Mutavolts to defend himself. He's got Blind Obedience to, you know, take care of some things and gain some life. Uh, this is exactly where he wants to be, as Ketter is going to put Blue Kronos onto the stack here, knowing that it is going to come into play tapped. We'll see if he does any attacking here. Attacking into this board seems fraught with some peril. It's not the best, but he is going to fire at Mutavolt, thinking I can't, I can't just sit here and do nothing. Yeah. You know, it does just play in to the blue-eyed control deck's favor. So now here comes the Corsair and here comes the Mutavolt. Yeah, it is, it is hard to imagine getting to win this game if Adrian gets a comfortably Look at three more cards again with that chase. Yeah. Things are unraveling for, for, for Kent, certainly, so. Now, this is mighty interesting. Because now, okay, so in Mutavolt gets activated, but before blocks, Kent's going to use Blue Kronos' ability. Monstrosity for two. Take care of this Mutavolt. And so Adrian says, okay, that's fine. I'm going to activate my other Mutavolt. How about that? And he says, all right, trade with your Mutavolt. So now that problem's solved. But Jace bites the dust from the Corsair. So now Adrian does have a couple of cards in his hand, but we're not sure what they are. You see Polychronos currently a 7-7. I feel like all the creatures might go away in a minute. Oh, yeah. And it, yeah, Adrian has very nicely set the board into this state right here. Now, here's the issue. Kent does have that charm in his hand, 
but we know that Adrian has to dissolve into Sam. So as you mentioned, Adrian has done a beautiful job of getting himself into this particular position. Dissolve is going to take care of that. Adrian conveniently has used all of his mana to cast Verdict, Extort, Dissolve, Extort, and let's say if Kenner were to draw, you know, a Stormbridge Dragon, comes into play tap. If you were to draw a Rakdos return, doesn't matter because I'm hiding the best card top of my deck. You know? Yeah. Like I said, this is a, this is a classic style of blue-white. Yeah. Now, we knew that Corsair was coming, obviously, but, you know, just giving examples, you now see Zanigo Scott of the Revels kind of hanging out on top of there, so that's another problem that Adrian has to take care of now. Now all he needs to really do is find one of his big Planeswalkers or perhaps Revelations to really lock this one up. Yeah, just looking for a way to win now. And Revelations does, Re Sphinx of Revelation does act as a win condition now. Yeah. It would be for far too much. Yes. See Sullivan sitting at 16, Ketter at 14. Both these players sitting at 4-0 and here. Ketter did win game number one. As Sullivan did have some mana problems here, but no problems this game at all for Adrian. As you will pass back to Ketter, Zenigo is going to be the draw for the turn. There is a Reaper of the Wilds off the top soon from Ketter. But he's going to deploy this uh, this god. A lot of haymakers in the in the Jun deck post board. We're oh, just yeah. seeing a lot of fours and fives and sixes. Yep. You, well, you just know that the games are going to go long, and trying to outquick them doesn't really make a lot of sense. You see Xenagos is going to target the Courser. It's going to put Sullivan down to 12. And, you know, you see Adrian here not really panic very much. Just say, that's fine. Not a big deal. Presumably, I have answers either in my hand or ones that I can draw to take care of this. Well, I imagine that Xenagos has to be worthy of an answer. I would agree. I would agree. That card is yeah. worth answering. That one's in a different place. Oh, no. Is this the D-Sphere Disperse thing again? Okay, this is... Oh, no, just a whole lot no, worse. No, no big deal. Yeah. No, just, uh, just Elspeth and D-Sphere. So he's going to extort off of the, uh, he's going to extort off of the D-Sphere and then play the Elspeth. We'll get some soldier tokens out there for you guys in just a moment. But Elspeth is sitting at five. And again, Adrian's working with perfect information. He knows that, okay, Reaper is going to be the card that you draw. Let's see what this card is. That's an overgrown team. Sure, you can play that. You'll gain a life. You go up to 15 as you're putting into play tap as opposed to untapped. Here's the top card. It's a Blood Crypt. That'll be your draw step for the turn. So I don't have to worry about another spell for at least two turns. Here's a Reaper of the Wild. You see Ketter's going to play that pre-combat. So if that if Sullivan does do any blocking, I think it's a scry. Put that Blood Crypt to the bottom. So Reaper comes into play tapped from the Blind Obedience, of course. Now we see uh, Ketter attacking with the Corsair. We'll see exactly where it's going. If it's going towards Elspeth or the, uh, the face. Neither really good attack. Uh, yeah, neither, neither, neither is great. Attack. I mean, I, I feel like you have to err on the side of attacking Elspeth because... Uh, the Adrian's life total seems fairly high to me, but, but Ken's going to go after Adrian. Yeah, maybe his thought process is, I need to get you a little lower and maybe hope to peel a uh, Rakdos's return or something. You know, maybe that's the way that I get myself out of this situation. Yeah, maybe that Elspeth is uh, essentially immune for this game, so yeah. what are you going to do? That's a great feeling. <laughs> I can't go after your Elspeth. You see... Uh, so Adrian's going to block. It's going to allow Ketter to put the top card to the bottom for the Reaper trigger, and now they're okay. Okay. All right. That's a magic card. There is an Elspeth in play, obviously, to take care of it, but that's a magic card. It at least forces Adrian some action out of Adrian. Yeah. Dissolve off the top. It's a good draw. See, because it's Counterspell. Counterspell's good. It's, it's good against, <laughs> you know, whatever. Yeah. Most things. Yeah. Once you get to this spot, they're, they're just good draws. Yeah. How many dissolves throughout Adrian 75? He has three dissolves in the main deck and, yeah, three, three. three main. A lot of people always wonder, why can't we just reprint Counterspell? Not a good idea. Because Cancel is, if anything, quite underplayed in its history it, through uh, standard formats, yeah. and uh, Counterspell is considerably better. <laughs> I know that uh, Patrick Chapin had designed a... I know there was talks on social media about him designing a cube that was based off of, you know, the cards that top aided a Pro Tour or won a Pro Tour or something like that. I think Counterspell was maybe the, the most heavily played card yeah. of those cards when he was selecting from decks that did I'm this. I'm going to guess that that cube, the Pro Tour deck winning cube, is probably filled with a lot of card drawing counter spells and fast mana. That's my guess. Yeah, it's probably. If like I had that. a hazard to guess, I'm saying. <laughs> I'm willing to bet it's filled with a lot of that. You see Dissolve on that Rourke Thar. It's a good Dissolve target. As you do see, yeah. Elspeth is going to uh, tick on up here. Three more soldiers are going to come hang out here. And it looks like Adrian's just going to comfortably pass the turn up with a wall of mana. I know we do have a question here at home uh, on Twitter. Can you please explain the Disperse and D-Sphere thing? I, I didn't understand since it was too fast. Oh, okay. So what happens is the... Uh, Detention Sphere enters the battlefield. You choose a target. 
and that goes on the stack. In response, while that is still on the stack, you uh, disperse your detention sphere back to your hand. That causes the when detention sphere leaves play trigger to enter the battlefield. That resolves first, but the original comes into play trigger has still not resolved. Mm -hmm. So the leaves play uh, trigger resolves. It does nothing essentially. Then the exile that comes into play trigger on detention sphere resolves, permanently exiling the initial target. Correct. So, it's some fancy pants action. Yeah, so basically what it lets you do is a little two-card combo lets you reuse your detention sphere. You know, I, this is the first time I've ever seen someone scoop your revelation. Uh, you haven't watched me play very much. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first time that's ever happened as Adrian Sullivan is going to win game number two here between him and Kent Ketter. Moving on to game number three between these two guys who have just been having a heck of a last, you know, half year. Yeah, that's been a, a good match so far. You know, it's going to be great for Kent, obviously, to be on the play as Adrian is so counterspell dense in these post-board games that yep. it's, you know, it, it, it being an, out in front with mana matters for so much. Uh, but yeah, at uh, Pro Tour Dragon's Maze, I conceded to Nassif's... I was there, I was there. N Nassif revelated for five or six, I feel like, around turn five, and I'm like, all right, we're done, just pack it up, and he just said, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> because he yeah. Got, we both know the outcome, you know yeah. what I mean? I, I, I have this philosophy, you know. You, you spend X hours playing magic, however many that might be. The more of that percentage, you know, you imagine it's a it's a pie, there's 100 percentage points. The longer that you spend playing games that you're winning, the, probably the happier you are in life in general. <laughs> so I'm very fast to, it, it, definitely if I have a flaw as a, a tournament magic player, that's unique to me. It's conceding way too fast. Sure. I can see, I've conceded games at PTQ where I looked at the top three cards of my deck and been like, oh, well, I guess I was actually probably going to win if I just played that out. But, you know, so I lose, I lose some matches that way. That's not great. But on the upside, generally speaking, when I'm involved in a match, I'm in the process of winning. Because if I was in the process of losing, I would have just conceded. Yeah, why would I play anymore? Right. That's ridiculous. I, I don't know who it was. I think it may have been the Seath match, but I think, like, when I came over... Um, when I was walking through the rows during Pro Tour Dragon's Maze, I think you had like a Boros Charm in this deck for lethal, and you're just like, I hope you don't Revelation. And they're like, I have Revelation. And they just tapped all their mana and cast it, and you're like, we're done here. And you just picked them up. Yeah. You're just like, that's fine. You have it. That sucks, but you win. Yeah. I so, get it. It's, <laughs> you know? That is, a, that is a good card, and you win. Right. So you do see both players shuffle up here. No uh, no real go back to the sideboard or anything. They're very comfortable with their configuration. Ketter going to be on the play here in round number five of 11 here in St. Louis. And just like we answered that question on Twitter, you guys can fire away. We will answer them as you do see Ketter going to go down to six. At SCG Live, hashtag SCG STL. You can also tweet myself at Cedric A. Phillips or Patrick Sullivan at Basic Mountain. We do have our handy dandy iPhones. Fire away, my friends. We got a lot of magic covers, so we got plenty, we do. We got a, plenty of time to answer questions. Yeah. I still, I, you know, I, it's still very early in the tournament, of course, but I feel like we're starting to see standard kind of shift a little bit, you know, in this tournament. Yes. We're starting to see, we've seen a lot of green-red monsters, and we've seen decks that are reactions to that. We saw the Junk Reanimator list. Not that that deck won, but clearly trying to go after red green monsters a little bit. Uh, Joe Bernal is doing well in this tournament. He's cut... Packrat all together from his mono black deck, and he's playing main deck Lifebane Zombies. Even if it, it's, you know, it's starting to feel like small ripples of metagame development are starting to shape up. I was able to talk to Joe while we were on one of our breaks just about that decision and how he felt about it. And he says, you know what? I think that's a good decision. Um, you know, people kind of look at, um, you see, I was Mystic here off of Stomping Grounds. People kind of look at Packrat as a sacred cow of cards that you can't ever touch in mono black, but it, it has certainly gotten worse over the past month or so. And we know he started off the tournament 3-0. and We'll, of course, have updates for you guys on how he's doing and other people that we're following. But he's, uh, he's happy with his choice. Yeah, and, and Joe, there's a lot of history with that of, of him as a deck builder of just uh, not taking anything for granted. And, and I know that he's pretty closely associated with Caleb Durward, who's mm -hmm. another player I consider in the same school of deck building, where it's not, about, it's not about well, I'm playing this card because it's good. It's just everything's contextual and don't take anything for granted. See Tommy Rad on turn two here. Gonna put Adrian underneath the gun. Here's a Temple of Silence. So now the counterspell wall's down for Ketter. And it looks like he has a, a Overgrown Tomb and a Reaper of the Wilds that he can put into play. Uh, and that's just ignoring what he may find off of Domri Rad. So he's got a nice start here. Is now an Abrupt Decay is the draw for the turn. So Domri's gonna go up to five. And we have seen this before. Domri can steal a game against Blue White Control. Yeah, certainly on a mulligan, turn two Domri's as much as you can really ask for here. Turn two Domri, turn three Clock with Reaper of the Wilds. And if that gets dealt with, you've got an Abrupt Decay, presumably, to take care of Detention Sphere, whatever that's targeting. You You've also got a Muta Vault in that row, and now Adrian is kind of on the tap land draw with a third temple. There's a Temple of Deceit. 
And even if Domri never actually finds a single creature, the fact that it's threatening its ultimate is really scary. Yes. You know? So we're going up. Let's see what he finds. Doesn't find anything in consequence. Just passes the turn back. So Sullivan's going to untap. He'll take a draw here. And if he's on the Supreme Verdict plan, you see Ketter does have Lugari Charm in his hand. And you can tell the difference of being on the play versus on the draw in this particular situation, but also the power of Van Acceleration. Yeah. That's the big one here. Uh -oh. Adrian, oh, no. Uh oh Is this not a fourth land for him? As he's been scrying a bunch this game, so that would be very surprising if that were the case. Either way, he's in some trouble. Yes. Because the, the, the nature of Ken's hand is very good against, you know, if all of Adrian's hand is Supreme Verdicts, then that's great. We just get to ride Domri to victory. Mm -hmm. And if he has answers to Domri, we get to answer those with Golgari Charm and Abrupt Decay while clocking with our board. So and that is a discard there from Adrian. So Ketter is going to slowly untap, slowly draw a card. We'll see what he's able to find as he's going to pump up the jam here. Take a look. It's another Reaper of the Wilds. So let's see how he wants to attack here. Because attacking here is a little bit interesting. You know, there's the, you know, there's the fact that, uh, you know, Azorius Charm could come into play. But I suppose if Azorius Charm was something that Sullivan had, he would have cycled to try to hit a land. Yeah. So, you know, you can, I, I think Kent can kind of go through the iterations of what happens if he has X, what happens if he has Y, what happens if he has Z, and make the best decision. And it looks like that decision is just to attack with Reaper of the Wilds. And the mixture of a Hexproof creature and the Domri threatening to go ultimate here means that Kent can play very conservatively. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to, you know, he can kind of, he's in a, a position where he has the luxury of kind of playing around everything. So Reaper comes in and puts Sullivan down to 11. And now Adrian, you can tell he's not too thrilled about how things are going this game. Yeah, these, uh, you know, uh, of course, Adrian's missing land drops. That's, that's never a good thing. But you can tell... Ken's start here is so much better against counter spells while he's on a play, on the play with a main accelerant, mm -hmm. than when he's on the draw without one. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's night and day. It, yeah, it's, it sounds obvious, but it, it's hard to know exactly what the, what the difference is until you're watching a game like this. So now Adrian's going to tap some mana. He's got to cycle his Orange Charm. Yuck. And I, think <laughs> I believe that is a hearty laugh there from Adrian. He's got a bunch of bunch of cards in his hand, and he's just going yeah. to extend the hand, knowing that Domri's going to go ultimate. So Kent Ketter, two-time finalist here so far this year in the Open Series, is off to another beautiful start. Yeah. <laughs> he is sitting at 5-0 with a smile on his shoulder shrug. Gives Adrian Sullivan his first loss on the weekend. John Monsters sitting at 5-0, giving Blake Control his first loss.